Hey everyone, back here again after a bit of a hiatus with a wonderful differential equations problem for you. I have a thin chain of total length L of uniform mass density sigma placed on a horizontal frictionless table and I dangle a little bit of length B initially over the side. Now, how long will it take for the chain to slide completely off the table? Well, I'm going to start by calling the length of the dangling bit X because it changes with time and the acceleration of the chain I'm going to call that A. It's always the same throughout the chain at any point in time. And now I'm going to fall back on some fundamental mechanics and write a net force expression for the entire chain at any point in time. We know that conceptually net force is just the proper combination of all the individual forces and courtesy of Newton we know that that is mass times acceleration of the entire chain at any point in time. Equating those two right hand sides together gives us a nice way to go from here. I know that entire mass is just sigma times the entire length, that takes care of the left hand side there, and the only individual force contributing to the motion of this thing is the force of gravity acting on the dangling bit. That gravitational force is increasing from moment to moment, because x is increasing from moment to moment, so the mass of that dangling portion times g is simply sigma times x times g, and we have some useful information now to work with. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time, and the sigmas are going to cancel, and I'm going to do something now that's somewhat unexpected. I'm going to utilize the chain rule on that derivative of velocity. Clearly velocity is a function of the dangling bit, x, and x is a function of time, so I actually have an opportunity here to utilize the chain rule. dv dt is dv dx times dx dt. And dx dt, just like acceleration was dv dt, is just v. Velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. Just rewriting things in purple here, and we can rewrite further with a fact about differentials. dv is dv dx dx. Rewriting gives us something that is eminently integrable, and we can solve for v explicitly now if we're careful with our bounds of definite integration. When v is zero, it's stationary. When it's stationary, x is b. And when v is v, x is x. Some careful integration. Square rooting gives us our expression for v as a function of x. It's worth remembering though that even though v here is explicitly a function of x, x is still a function of t. So v here is also implicitly a function of time as well, enabling us to rewrite v as dx dt. Now we just have x's and t's, rewriting again with some fundamental differential facts gives us this guy at the bottom left. Eminently integrable as before, and once again we want to be careful with our bounds of integration. When x is b, t is 0, the problem hasn't started, and when x is l, i.e. the entire chain has just fallen off the table, let's call that time that goes with it tf. tf is what we're trying to find. x initial is b and x of tf is l. The entire chain has just fallen off the table here. But, how in the world do I integrate an unwieldy fellow like that with a square root of x squared minus b squared in the denominator and pretty mega pickings for the numerator if I do say so myself? Simple use substitution is not going to fly, my friends, so we're going to have to harken back to trigonometric substitution. As you see there, my nice reference right triangle, I seek in that theta x over b, I solve for x, I take the derivative to get an expression for dx, and I'm left with something that lets me rewrite the integral in terms of theta. I rewrite the denominator a little bit. Some nice cancellation happens, secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared, giving me yet another opportunity to nicely cancel things out. I am left with secant theta now. And here's a really neat trick to do this guy. I just rewrite 1 in an interesting way. A fun way, a secant plus 10 over secant plus 10. That leaves me with this guy here as my numerator, and that guy there as my denominator. And the benefit of this is that if I let you be the denominator, du turns out to be that numerator exactly giving me a nice crisp natural log guy like so now if we really wanted to we could rewrite this expression with theta values for our bounds of integration but how about instead we fall back into the familiar comfortable territory of x values as bounds of integration to do that write the theta expression in terms of x Using the right triangle, secant is x over b, tangent of theta is the square root of x squared minus b squared over b, and our bounds of integration are now x values. x initial is b, x of tf is l, being careful with computation now leaves that guy there as our final answer for the time it takes for the chain to just slip off the table. 
What makes this problem really nice, I feel, is just the fact that it involves a few different conceptual arenas acting in concert. We had differential calculus, especially a crucial move with the chain rule early on, a swath of integral calculus, particularly with respect to that trigonometric substitution party there at the end, and all of this was happening on a foundation of fundamental mechanics, net force considerations, and Newton's law of motion. That's what made this problem really nice, I thought.